interdisciplinary conversation within the graduate community itself. And the lecture is one of the ways that we go about doing it. Every year we have five lectures that is funded by the Presidential Fellowship. And this is the first lecture, as Georgia mentioned. And we will have two more lectures later this semester, and two more in the spring semester. So you look out in your inbox. And with that, we'd like to introduce our Associate Housemaster, Neil Shah, who will be introducing the speaker. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you to Wen and Georgia for uh, doing such a great job in organizing OC lectures. And uh, thank you to Governor Dukakis um, for being our inaugural lecturer. Thank you to Kitty for joining us tonight as well. Um, we're very excited to have you. I think the topic today is a sort of far-reaching topic about national and international politics. There's not really a better person anywhere to be talking about this subject. Governor Dukakis was the longest serving governor in the history of Massachusetts. Uh, first held public office in 1965, became governor in 1975, I believe. I love my Dukakis trivia. Um, <laughs> and then uh, in 1988 was the nominee, uh, the Democratic nominee for president of the United States. On a personal level, I'll tell you. You know, I'm a big political junkie. Politics were really important growing up in my family. And that uh, televised debate uh, between Governor Dukakis and George Bush, um, sort of my kind of formative experience in getting hooked in politics. It was dinner table conversation every day uh, during that period growing up for me. I never thought I'd actually have the opportunity now to be introducing Governor Dukakis. Um, unfortunately, you know, that election didn't work out for us. Uh, however, uh, that has not stopped the last, uh, last quarter century, you know, political pundits have speculated about what the nation and the world would be like if we only had a Dukakis presidency. Um, since that time, um, you know, Governor Dukakis has stayed you know, active primarily as a teacher, um, both at Northeastern and at UCLA. Uh, I'm one of the students that benefited from uh, his generosity, uh, and just, I think, as a way of underscoring uh, his legacy, um, you know, even most recently, you know, whenever there's an election, whether it's a state election or a federal election, both journalists and the candidates themselves seek to talk to Dr. Governor Dukakis' advice. Um, when uh, Ted Kennedy's seat needed to be filled, there were rumors all over the internet that uh, we're going to draft Governor Dukakis to step in, and he was like, no thanks. Um, when John Kerry was drafted to be Secretary of State, there were rumors on the internet that you know all the people that we can pick need to pull Governor Dukakis back in. Uh, most recently, I read that there was a proposal to rename South Station uh, after Governor Dukakis, which he politely declined. Um, but I think this underscores just how tremendous his legacy is um, as kind of the elder statesman of the Democratic Party. Uh, we're incredibly fortunate to have him with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you, all, thank you all very much. Um, so how come I lost in 1988? Neil <laughs> Shaw wasn't my campaign mate. Um, it was great to be here, and I really have enormous respect for you guys. Because you see, Katie and I both grew up in Brooklyn. And uh, I graduated from Brooklyn High School in 1951, decided to go to a small Quaker college called Swarthmore College. Any Swarthmore graduates on? No? Sorry. Okay. Um, and frankly, I'd never been out of New England. I mean, you didn't get on a plane and go places. And I didn't know a Quaker from a shaker. <laughs> so off I went to uh, Swarthmore College, and uh, I was a kind of tenant of Queen Bet. I don't know whether I told you that. My dad was this remarkable guy who had come over here from a predominantly Greek town in western Turkey at the age of 15 in 1912. And uh, amazingly, he didn't speak a word of English, and I met one spot. We had a couple of brothers who were working in Mills and Lowell and Lawrence. And that young man, 12 years later, was graduated from our brothers. How we did it? Folks, I have no idea. Practice medicine at 454 Huntington Avenue, across from the Museum of Fine Arts. 52 years. That building is now bursting in all of the University of Washington. And uh, so I was, my brother was not interested in, in medicine, so I was kind of the, the guy who was going to see my dad. And uh, I had taken biology and chemistry at Brookline High, and I had done well. So when I went to Swarthmore, I figured I'd start with physics. 
And after a year of general physics, I came to the conclusion that there was a piece of my brain marked physics that was missing. <laughs> Folks, I just couldn't get it. The harder I worked, the worse I did. Meantime, I was having a wonderful time in political science and economics and history. So at the end of that first year in general physics 101, I called my father and said, Dad, I don't think you're going to succeed. He was very good about it. And I decided to go into politics instead, which was OK. I mean, it's been an interesting life, needless to say. Um, how many of you are international students? Where from? What, what countries? Singapore, Ghana, Lebanon, Mexico, Mexico, Canada, Israel. Okay. Um, given the international nature of this, I thought what I would do is uh, I don't often do formal speeches, but I several weeks ago I delivered a talk at the International Political Science Association in Montreal entitled World Peace or Perpetual War. A choice ahead. And uh, with your indulgence, I'm going to deliver it again because it's, it was an effort on my part, folks. Um, I don't deliver a lot of <coughs> speeches to see if I couldn't distill my own ideas. By the way, my own concerns about what's going on in the world these days and what I think are missed opportunities to create a world in which, and I'm serious, war is ruled out as a means for settling disputes between them and them. So indulge me in this, if you will. Be as critical as you want to be. This probably won't take more than 30 minutes, and then we're going to open things up, and you have at me, because I'm really very concerned about your reactions to this. Um, here's a quote for you. We must face the fact that the United States is neither omnipotent nor omniscient, that we are only 6% of the world's population, that we cannot impose our will upon the other 94% of mankind, that we cannot right every wrong or reverse each adversity, and that therefore there cannot be an American solution to every world problem. Who said that? No. Nope. History students in the room? John Kennedy, 1963, at a famous address he made at American University in Washington shortly before he was tragically assassinated. Here's another quote for you. Trying to eliminate Saddam would have incurred incalculable human and political costs. We would have been forced to occupy Baghdad and, in effect, rule Iraq. Furthermore, we had been consciously trying to set a pattern for handling aggression in the post-Cold War world. Going in and occupying Iraq, thus unilaterally exceeding the United Nations mandate, would have destroyed the precedent of international response, which we hope to establish. Who said that? George H.W. Bush. How about this one? The only new thing in the world is the history you don't know. Who said that? Harry S. Truman. For several years, I've been raising questions about U.S. foreign and national security policy. In fact, I was raising them in the presidential election of 1988, but I did a pretty poor job of articulating the deal and getting myself elected at the same time. A lot has happened since 1988, needless to say. The Cold War ended shortly thereafter, and while I didn't think George H.W. Bush was a particularly good domestic president, he understood what was going on in the world, successfully negotiated an end of the Cold War with Mikhail Gorbachev, and called for the creation of what he called a new world order. These are Bush's words, not mine. He meant a world in which, with the strong support of the United States, International law and international institutions would be strengthened. Developing countries could look to the international community for support in transforming themselves into increasingly democratic and prosperous places. And the U.S. would no longer be required to run around the world acting like an international policeman. 
I thought he demonstrated that belief impressively during the Gulf War. Jim Baker, as Secretary of State, made at least seven trips to the Middle East to win support for concerted UN-backed action against Saddam's aggression against Kuwait. To a remarkable degree, the world community supported that action, the vast majority of Arab nations among them. And he was very clear about why he would not respond to his critics on the right who kept pushing him to go all the way to Baghdad and get rid of Saddam Hussein and his government. <coughs> Going in, he said, and occupying Iraq, thus unilaterally exceeding the United Nations mandate, would have destroyed the precedent of international response, the precedent of international response to aggression that we hope to establish. Too bad his son did read his father's memoirs. We could have avoided a lot of trouble and saved thousands of lives and at least $2 trillion the ultimate cost of the Iraq war. And we might have avoided what now appears to be the near dissolution of Iraq. But George W. Bush isn't the only person who didn't understand what his father meant when he talked about a new world order. In fact, there are very few people these days who are discussing it. Instead, we seem to be caught up in a world of new Cold War scenarios, 19th century-like military alliances, and a failure to take advantage of the extraordinary opportunity the elder Bush described for us a world in which force would increasingly be ruled out as a means for settling disputes between and among countries, and the rules for doing so would be enforced by strong and credible international peacekeeping institutions. I wish I could tell you that that world has taken shape and evolved and grown over the past 25 years, but virtually the opposite too often has taken place. Invading Iraq, in my opinion, had to be one of the dumbest things my country has ever done. And the consequences have not only been predictable, the policy itself is in ashes, and so is the pipe dream of the unified democratic Iraq. But that was by no means the first major military or diplomatic intervention since World War II that has fallen flat in its face. Iran and the United States today might well be solid allies if we hadn't overthrown the democratically elected government of Iran. That CIA-led overthrow of that democratically elected government of, uh, I take it back, the CIA-led overthrow of the democratically elected government of Guatemala the following year, 1954, caused untold suffering and hurting, especially for that country's indigenous people. After buying into the Eisenhower administration's plan to invade Cuba in 1961 and watching it fail, JFK asked himself, how could I have been so stupid? Now we know that two years later, he authorized the secret resumption of talks with Castro designed to lead to normal and peaceful relations between the United States and Cuba. Had he not been assassinated, the U.S. embargo, which has not got, now gone on for over 50 years, would probably have been lifted, and over time a very different Cuba would have emerged. The list of failed American interventions, or for that matter Soviet or Russian interventions, goes on and on. Nicaragua, Afghanistan, Chile, Lebanon, Ukraine, Libya, one after another, with sad and after tragic consequences. And whoever the genius was who convinced policymakers in Turkey and France and the White House and members of the U.S. Congress that active military intervention on behalf of this or that rebel group in Syria made sense, in my judgment, should be peremptorily, peremptorily fired. Didn't they understand what was likely to happen? And when the UN Secretary General asked Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General, to become the UN mediator in this dispute when it first began, and Annan skillfully put together a 16-nation conference, including Syria, committed to the peaceful and democratic transformation of that country, without a side, we refused to attend. Why? Because Iran without whom there cannot be a peaceful resolution of the Syrian situation, had been invited as one of the 16 by an Two days later, and I quit, I don't have to tell you about the Syrians like this. At least 200,000 people killed more than 3 million refugees. Nearly three years later, John Kerry tried to put together that same kind of conference. But it was too late. It was too late. We all know what's been happening in Syria. The 
worst of the rebel groups started growing, in, not only growing in strength in Syria, but in the process of trying to put together its own country, straddling what are now Syria and Iraq. The UN Secretary General renewed the invitation to Iran to attend, but the main Syrian opposition forces said they would not attend unless Iran unequivocally and publicly committed to Assad's removal, something that they were not prepared to do. More recently, we seem to be heading right down a Cold War path in Asia and in the Pacific. I am still trying to figure out what the U.S. pivot to Asia was all about. We keep telling the Chinese that it really isn't about them when it clearly is about them. And seems to reflect a fear of, of what? That they are an increasingly powerful country, that they will soon have the largest domestic economy in the world, that they will be in a position to assert themselves in the Pacific. At the present time, we have at least six countries, including China, Japan, the two Koreas, Vietnam, and the Philippines, arguing over who owns what island in the South and East China Seas. The U.S. has jumped in on behalf of our allies. To do what? Why isn't the international community urging all of these countries to take their territorial disputes to the World Court or the Law of the Sea Tribunals? Isn't that what they were created to do? It certainly beats our announcement that we are putting a drone base in Japan, or Japan's announcement that it, is, it, that it has reinterpreted its constitution to prevent it to rearm and take more aggressive military action in the Pacific. In the meantime, we complain that the Chinese are hacking into American as well as other national or private sector information systems while we are doing precisely the same thing and are well on our way to spending billions on 11 cyber warfare teams that will presumably be able to wage cyber warfare against the Chinese and others in ways that are almost certainly going to set off an international cyber war. Do we want this? Is it, likely to contribute to a more, is it likely to contribute to a more peaceful world? Why aren't we calling for an international conference designed to do everything it can to stop a cyber arms race before it becomes the newest international battlefield? Moreover, these efforts are not limited just to the Pacific Theater. At last count, there were some 837 American military bases in 150 countries. At this more than 25 years after the Cold War officially ended, one of our newest military frontiers is apparently Africa. We now have an American African military command under a major general, its headquarters is in Stuttgart, Stuttgart, Germany. It has a thousand employees there and is currently spending nearly a half a billion dollars in more than 15 African countries, many of them, by the way, headed by dictators, on the equipping and training of African armies. It reminds me of what we were doing in Latin America in the 1950s and 1960s when we were supporting a flock of Latin American dictators at the time when there were only three genuinely democratic governments in all of Latin America. In fact, it was so bad that Fred Harris, who was then the United States Senator from Oklahoma, a very funny guy, commented that all you needed in South America was a uniform and a pair of sunglasses. And if you told us you were anti communist we'd support you, politically and militarily. And support them, we did. Batista, Sambosa, Jimenez, Odria, Pinochet, and more. Not exactly a Democratic Hall of Fame. They did little to stem the march of communism, but they did a pretty good job of suppressing the liberties of their own people with help from us. All of this has cost us trillions of dollars that could have been used to do great things at home and to help developing nations abroad. Iraq and Afghanistan alone will end up costing us somewhere in the neighborhood of three trillion dollars. And we still haven't fully tallied the costs of those countries as they both appear to be on the verge of falling apart after years of war financed by us and others. Now, I understand that there is a threat that faces us and that we must take seriously. And that is the kind of terrorism that seems to have developed primarily but not exclusively in the Middle East. I'm not naive. I spent 16 months of my life as a young American soldier, seven miles from the DMZ in Korea. And while I was fortunate to arrive there after the truth with North Korea had been signed, I was very much aware of what the Cold War at the time meant and what it required of us and our allies. But that was then, and this is now. The Pacific is a relatively peaceful place these days. What the international community, it seems to me, should be doing 
is trying to calm the waters and bring important international institutions into the picture that can create a framework for peace and security for all of the Pacific nations. Just as the EU has brought peace and relative stability to a part of the world that has known nothing but war since the beginning of human history. Russia is no longer the Soviet Union, and while Vladimir Putin is not going to win the ACLU's Man of the Year over Russia, he is at the very least holding together a country whose fragmentation could be highly destabilized. And he too is facing the constraints of a new year. It was the idea of a full-scale war on the continent is unthinkable. In the meantime, virtually the entire Western Hemisphere is now under the control of mostly democratic governments. And while one can be troubled by what has been going on in Venezuela lately, the idea currently being pushed by some members of the US Congress that we should both impose an economic boycott on that country because we don't agree with the man that the Venezuelan voters for better or for worse elected in the most recent election is, in my judgment, absurd. The US is a member of the Organization of American States. It's bound by its charter. That charter is clear. No member state has the right to interfere directly or indirectly in the internal affairs of another member state. If there are concerns about the state of democracy in Venezuela, the OAS is perfectly capable of handling them. And while that process can be frustrating at times, it certainly beats embargoes that are both a violation of the OAS charter and are bound to fail as they have so miserably in Cuba. Even in the case of terrorism, it seems clear that pouring billions and trillions into F-35s and super carriers is utterly useless if your goal is to stop and defeat terrorism. Terrorists are not afraid of F-35s and super carriers. They're utterly irrelevant to what they do. If we're going to stop them, it will require tough and collaborative international police work that penetrates these organizations and breaks them up. That work is not easy. It requires persistence and tenacity. But investing billions on elaborate weapon systems will do little to stop them. What then might be a sound policy which the United States and the international community might adopt to build a peaceful world that increasingly rejects perpetual war as either a necessary or effective basis for creating a world of peace? First, such a policy must embrace the United Nations and its constituent agencies as the best hope for creating a framework for a new and more peaceful world. Yes, the UN has its limitations, but we won't help it to become the institution many of us hoped it would when it was created in San Francisco in 1945 if we keep ignoring it. It should be strengthened, not weakened, with an expanded security council that more accurately reflects the world as it is today. I had the opportunity recently to read the testimony at a hearing before the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee on the subject of problems in the Pacific, particularly with respect to China. The senators spoke, a number of presumably expert witnesses spoke, and were questioned by committee members. Not once during that committee session did the words the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, or the Law of the Sea Treaty ever cross the lips of anybody. Instead, it was all about who was doing what to whom, who was allied with whom, and what the U.S. was going to do with China, a country that has bought billions of U.S. bonds, ships us billions worth of goods to the United States, and now has nearly a quarter of a million of young people going to school in the United States every year. And when the president of China decided to make a visit to Seoul, Korea recently, American commentators to a person interpreted this as an effort on his part to weaken or destroy our longtime alliance with South Korea. Nobody seemed to suggest that stronger and closer ties between China and South Korea might lead to a less difficult and ultimately more responsible non-nuclear North Korea. Or that a China that engages with its neighbors in a peaceful and constructive way while being urged by the international community to submit its territorial claims to the world court might make a real contribution to a world that settles its differences peacefully and rejects the notion that we are forever doomed to perpetual hostility and conflict. 
Please note that at no time during this talk have I suggested that my country abandon its leadership role in world affairs. Nothing would be worse than a retreat to Fortress America. I'm a committed internationalist. Though son of Greek immigrants could possibly be other one. I want my country to play a strong and constructive role in making this world a better place for our children and our grandchildren, and your children and grandchildren. But I want that role to be one that contributes to a world of peace. And that won't happen unless we work every day to create the kinds of laws and institutions that can keep the peace and will make it unnecessary for the U.S. to believe that it has to be deeply involved in every dispute on the planet. It is a world in which the U.S. will no longer have to spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year on weapons of war that I repeat are largely irrelevant to the real threats that we do face and that could make the U.S. and the world a much better place. In the meantime, despite all the sound and fury, especially in the Middle East and Eastern Europe, and this may strike you as being slightly bizarre, this is the most peaceful world that Kitty and I have ever lived in. Remember, we were the children of the Great Depression. Our childhood was defined by World War II. Our teen and college years were dominated by the Korean War and the McCarthy-inspired hysteria of the Cold War. Our early years of politics were bound up in the battle of what we were doing in Vietnam. And it is hard to describe to those of you who were not alive, or at least politically conscious at that time, how divided the United States was over that war. In fact, good patriotic Americans left their country to go to Canada because they refused to serve in it. And the hundreds of thousands of American soldiers that came home from it, 55,000 did not, were not greeted with kisses and flowers. And no sooner had we settled down to try to enjoy the peace dividend that we expected at the end of the Cold War to produce when we elected, or rather the Electoral College elected a president who not only didn't read his father's memoirs, but forgot something that Harry Truman used to say, the only new thing in the world is the history you don't know. Yes, we have serious conflict in the Middle East, and that regrettably will continue for some time. When the British and the French decided to create the map of, post -Ottoman, of the post-Ottoman Middle East, they didn't spend much time thinking about religion or ethnicity. In fact, it was oil and spoils of war that shaped the new map. Under the circumstances, trying to in intervene militarily in the Middle East or any other place without broad international agreement just won't work. What may work is the process that the Secretary General attempted to put in place in Syria with Kofi Annan. And it is that kind of process that deserves the support of sensible people all around the globe. Yes, the international community has real issues with Iran. It issues to repeat that, in my judgment, would have never arisen had we let the Iranian people develop their country and their democracy back in the 1950s. I think it is significant, however, that virtually the entire international community, including Russia and China, are involved in trying to resolve the issue of nuclear proliferation in Iran, and we have already made significant process of progress on that front, as well as convincing Syria to get rid of its chemical and nuclear weapons, no small achievement. Iran, by the way, is called for turning the Middle East into a nuclear-free zone. Of course, that would mean that Israel would have to give up its nuclear weapons. But if the UN could effectively enforce such an agreement, wouldn't it make a whole lot of sense? We say we are committed to eliminate nuclear weapons totally. Why not start in the Middle East before some of these extremist groups get them and begin to threaten the use? North Korea is obviously a difficult and often incomprehensible regime to deal with and one that is dangerously isolated. But China has already called for a resumption of six-power talks rather than an effort to damage U.S. ties with South Korea. President, the Chinese president's trip to Seoul seemed to me to be a strong message from him to North Korea. Good, co continued good relations between the U.S. and China is one of the keys to a gradual assumption of national and international <coughs> responsibility by North Korea, and we shouldn't forget it. So to sum up, how do we build a world at peace and not perpetual war? First, we must work hard to strengthen the UN and its peacekeeping agencies and missions. Second, we must use existing international peacekeeping institutions like the World Court and regional organizations like ASEAN, the EU, the OAS, and others 
as an important part of that peacekeeping architecture. Third, we must continue to pursue the goal of eliminating all nuclear weapons, a goal endorsed not only by the President of the United States, but by world leaders all over the world and Cold War veterans in this country, like George Shultz, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Dunn. Fourth, we should call for an international conference to stop cyber warfare before it begins, mushrooming, mushrooming around us and costing us additional billions we don't have. It could be far better used on important priorities at home and across the world. Fifth, we must work hard on our collective relationships with China and make sure that we sure don't blunder inadvertently into another Cold War that we don't want, we don't need. Sixth, we should focus laser-like on newer international challenges which cry out for strong international cooperation and leadership. What challenge? Developing and adopting international occupational safety and health standards, which will make tragedies like the, one we recently, the ones we recently witnessed in Bangladesh a thing of the past. Working hard to continue to improve international public health in ways that have already produced remarkable gains. You know, when I want a scholarship, go to the University of San Marcos in Lima, Peru in 1954. It was a wonderful experience. One out of every two Peruvian babies never lived to see its first birthday. 50% infant mortality in Peru. Today, infant mortality in Peru is about where it is in most other advanced countries. Remarkable, pro remarkable progress. Dealing effectively the kind of competition for food and water and energy that we will face during the rest of this century. And above all, working to make sure that climate change, which is getting worse, folks, not better, does not destroy the very planet on which we live. Needless to say, very few of these ideas are original with me. Most of them are discussed more ably and more effectively by others with far more diplomatic experience than I have. What is needed now, it seems to me, is a serious and sustained effort to make them work, because the future of this planet depends on it. Above all, let's try to heed the words of that young and dynamic U.S. president, who was born in a house not far from where Kay and I have lived for the past 51 years. What kind of peace do we see? Jack Kennedy asked in that speech at American University. Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave, but a genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life worth living. Not really a peace in our time, but peace in all time. The pursuit of peace, listen to these words, folks. The pursuit of peace, he said, is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war. Too many of us think it is impossible, but we have no more urgent task. Others think it's unreal, but that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. No problem of human destiny, Kennedy said, is beyond human beings. And listen to this. History teaches us, he said, that enmities between nations, as between individuals, do not last forever. The tide of time and events will often bring surprising changes in the relations between nations. We should not see conflict as inevitable, accommodation as impossible, and communication as nothing more than an exchange of threats. From the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we are all more. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, Governor Dukakis, for giving such a great speech. We will now open the floor to questions. So, before anyone, before anyone asks questions, please introduce yourself. And yeah, please. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Okay, my name is Rosalie Gladriu. I recently graduated from MIT and I'm from Canada, Mexico. Um, and I was very interested when you mentioned how you've seen so many examples of two sides uh, of a conflict sort of arguing against each other, insulting each other, and counting the wrongs and everything. 
Um, I've been actually, so we have a conflict resolution program at MIT. So I've been like the go-to person in my program for that. And since I've done the training, I can really see exactly what you're talking about, how we're really terrible at conflict resolution, at least on the international scale. So I was interested by what you said, but then you uh, went on to mention the possibility of an international police force. Uh, and Possibly. Yeah, so my problem with that is that we know actually the record of our police back home. I mean, I can only mention Ferguson, for example, but there's tons of examples where it's not working. And in general, at least for me, from a conflict resolution point of view, punitive forces rarely work. It's much better to listen to the other people and talk to them. And so I'm wondering what are your thoughts on that? Okay. I'm trying to make this brief. This is not to excuse what happened at Ferguson. Let me tell you, 50 years ago, what was going on with police forces all over this country? Makes Ferguson not look tame, but I mean, people were regularly taken to the back of police department. Police stations were beat up. Confessions were extorted. Um, if you were a person of color and a criminal defendant in the South, forget it. Forget it. You might be lynched before you were even tried. All white juries, I mean, that was the justice system in the United States. So I'm not defending what happened to Ferguson. In fact, Ferguson was an important wake-up call for us. But we have made enormous progress, let me tell you, along those lines. Um, now, nobody necessarily wants to spend a lot of money on police forces, but we do know that humans occasionally get into trouble. And we accept the fact that we need police forces. Preferably well trained folks that understand the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution, wherever they're doing their work. And um, occasionally you need that kind of thing. Let us assume, for example, that we would finally convince the Israelis and the Palestinians to agree on a two state solution. The Palestinians have already accepted the fact that there will have to be a security force in the West Bank for some extended period of time. Now, they don't want the Israelis there, but they're willing to accept a NATO security force, which sounds pretty reasonable to me, doesn't it to you? And they're willing to accept that. Why? Because they know that you can't, at least over the course of the first five or ten years, seriously talk about a two-state solution that works unless the Israelis themselves are assured that they will not be attacked continuously by folks from this new country. So it's not that you don't need the police occasion. The question is, can we institutionalize a process in which people sit down together, talk together, and you know, this is what I try to teach my students over at Northeastern who want to be public leaders. How do you bring people together? What kind of a process do you use to identify the folks that should and must be involved in that process and bring them to the table together? You mean, Folks that disagree, yes, precisely folks that disagree. It's amazing, folks, what happens when you use that process. I'll never forget one of the things that I did the second time around. You know, I, I was elected, I was defeated, I came back and beat the guy that beat me. And my lieutenant governor the second time around was a fellow named John Forbes Garrett. 